Again, thank you for joining our shuttle project session in the UK Shuttle Forum 28 edition now. Uh, I'm Elisa from IOM Geneva. I'm the lead editor of the next edition of Shuttle Projects. We expect to have a very stimulating session today, and we hope you participate of the discussion with us. So please, during the whole time, we invite you to you know, write questions, any comments, introduce yourself in the chat. So please do use the chat. Um, can you go to the next slide, please, Becca? So I know that most of you already know Shorter Projects, so I'll just give a very short introduction and then I will leave the floor to, to our guests. Um, Shorter Projects is uh, very hard to define. It's a compilation of case studies, but, you, but it's much more than that. Um, these case studies come from different regions, different organizations, um, and we have case studies illustrating different kinds of responses. Um, in the past 14 years now, the Shorter Projects collected more than 300 case studies and is a real piece of evidence to the sector. Um, and we know that Shorter is not only an output, it's not a product, but it's a process. And that's what the project tries to capture. So Shorter Projects not only about the outputs, is about the process, is about the challenges, and the most important is about the learnings. So the shelter project is this, is, is trying to, to discuss, to build evidence, to learn together. And that's how the idea of the shelter project's essentials was born. So after we are seeing the same learnings coming up again and again over the years, we have extracted some key messages that now are compiled in a special edition of Shorter Project Essentials that was launched last year on March. Uh, thank you. So these are the messages that we have extracted so far. For now, we know that these are you know, the first 12 of them, but we know that many more will come in the next years. Um, message will touch different topics. So you have you know, HLP, the importance of the coordination, inclusion, and the message will apply in different way, different contexts. So it, next slide, please, Martha. So for this session, uh, our plan, we decided to respond to the three questions that were proposed by the UK Shelter Forum organizers with three essential messages. So um, we have invited three very special guests. They're going deeper in the message, trying to link with their own experience, their own expertise. So we, with us, we have Eva, Somalia, Dave Hodgkins. We're supposed to have a Maya and Somalia. Um, she's having some technical issues, so I don't know if she'll be able to join us. Um, each one of them will have around 10, 15 minutes to present the, the message and share with us some, some case studies or their experience. And then we will have a round table to discuss. Um, our first guest was Amaya. I don't know if Amaya is already with us. Otherwise, we can skip it and go directly to Eva. So welcome, the three of you, and thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much, Elisa, for the introduction. Um, OK, so hopefully Amaya can join later. Here it is. Uh, hmm? That's not the final presentation, sorry. Ah, okay. Okay, sorry. Well, okay, okay. That was the, 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 other, the other slide, if you want. But anyway, uh, Lisa has introduced me already. I am Eva Samalea. For those who don't know me, I am currently independent, but um, I have been working in the shelter sector for the last years. And um, yeah, I'm here to share some thoughts and discuss together. Uh, hopefully, we can um, get out of the session with some good ideas to how we can make more sustainable, the shelter humanitarian responses. So yeah, as uh, Elisa was introducing to the shelter essentials and there are key questions and key messages in the in the shelter essentials com compile. And I'm gonna um, talk and not just like brainstorm around the one, the message I, uh, which is about local environmental damage is long lasting. So far in the shelter sector, um, uh, from my experience, uh, in the past, uh, well, from the beginning of my of my career, I have been 
looking forward to see this type of uh, awareness and, and work towards uh, more sustainable solutions. But it has been actually up to the past two years when I, can, I have seen a switch into the sector and more efforts together to, to, um, to work towards one, um, uh, more sustainable humanitarian shelter intervention. Still, we, the main efforts have been focused in um, improving the designs and reducing the carbon emissions. But my question is, and maybe that related with also another concept that has been discussed also is about, are we building, and as Elisa said, shelter is a process, but also my question is shelter and our homes. We are providing shelter, we are providing homes. We talk about sustainability, we talk about also resiliency. And from the shelter sector, if we are building resilient homes, we need to consider also the supply chain, the resilient commu the communities, and this involve, this implies um, more holistic intervention, actually. So how can we uh, consider that? Sorry, I'm not sure if this, uh, this noise is from my computer. I cannot mute it, sorry. <laughs> um, so how can we, uh, as the shelter sector, support these uh, um, more holistic interventions and uh, um, apart from the designs and carbon emissions, as I, as I said, to, to, uh, to consider the entire circle. For example, sustainable supply chain, will we consider, uh, should we consider how the supply chain is sustainable to ensure that it is sustainable, but also how it can uh, be connected with the, with the community with uh, some livelihoods activities, for example, or and the, exactly the, the same with the, with the resilient community. So this is why in this diagram you see this connection, uh, because we somehow sometimes are with the mindset of basic service providers, and we don't think about uh, um, um, other parts of the uh, building homes, resilient homes, that is imply and the entire, um, the entire circle to ensure that it is sustainable. And in this, uh, for this, in, in my opinion, we should be also promoting more synergies among sectors, which, as I said, livelihood or wash or CCCM, it's directly connected with shelter. I don't know if, if, if you don't think so, but in my opinion, if we don't consider that, it will not be sustainable. And actually, yesterday here in the Shelter UK Forum, we had the chance to have very interesting discussions on also, for example, how, for example, if uh, education and health sectors will also be uh, strategically uh, play a key role with us together to showcase more sustainable solutions, because sometimes we, we, um, we promote sustainable shelter solutions, and, and but then in the other sectors where also there are construction practices, construction activities, they, we don't discuss about this uh, sustainability in the construction itself and how the sectors can support each other for this. It's not just about the construction itself, it will be around all the entire sustainable, sustainability uh, cycle, but I think that this, is, uh, this can be maybe uh, some takeaway from, from these two past days that um, maybe to, to um, yeah, to work together towards the, the, the different sectors to, to promote more sustainable uh, construction practices. Still, uh, sustainable, and this is the question, sustainable shelter interventions are not sustainable, in my opinion, if, as I said, the supply, sustainable supply chain, if materials, for example, are not harvested or collected in a sustainable manner, because we are promoting uh, sustainable materials that if actually are not harvested properly may not be sustainable. Or if the quality or the treatment is not adequate, it may not be sustainable. Uh, because the, then we sh there are so many things that we should be taking into consideration uh, before we say we are our interventions are being sustainable because we use this material or you use this design. There are so many concepts that concepts that need to take to be um, taken into consideration. Also, if social needs are not met, then how it's going to be sustainable in the long term if the community is not happy there, is not accepting that. We have, we have so many discussions about this, and then maybe that's another topic for another moment. But uh, yeah, and again, 
this um, is related with the locally acceptance. So, but there are many other considerations, as we know, that involve sustainability. So um, then if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So here, for example, uh, and we could show many more, but I think that it is interesting to see the two different uh, contexts which actually have uh, are using the same material, and but they're totally different uh, uh, supply uh, sources. This is in Mozambique, then the one in the left, and then the other one is in Bangladesh, in Caucasus Bazar. Uh, both are using bamboo for construction of shelters. Uh, in one case, in Mozambique, the communities are harvesting the, 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 the bamboo for self-recovery, which is great, self-recovery, it is super good. Um, sometimes, uh, if, the, if it is possible, um, organizations are providing uh, the bamboo, are, are, are procuring the bamboo and supply and, and distributing it, but still the local supplier's capacity is super limited. The quality also is um, not, is, is, is most of the times is not accepted. So this is the context of Mozambique. And then we have the context of uh, Cox's Bazaar, where actually they will talk much more than me, but uh, where the host communities, uh, well, the, the bamboo is uh, provided to, uh, is, is coming from the host community and actually it is creating uh, um, income, it is actually for, um, uh, supporting income generating activities for the host community, which is great for the refugee camp. Also, they have set up a bamboo treatment facility using the bamboo life spans. This is great. So both are good using bamboo, but still does use bamboo guarantee that the, sustain, the, the response is sustainable. And there are so many question marks in both responses. And um, next slide, please. Yeah, and so here, for example, um, yeah, so basically in conclusion, and this is this will be repeated uh, in the two other in the two contexts in Mozambique and Bangladesh. If the where how the bamboo is harvested, is the is the um, there is, is there capacity within the host community in the case of Bangladesh or within the local community in in, in Mozambique. Uh, the affected population of the government for sustainable forestry management. Um, because otherwise, if it is not done properly, then the resources are limited. And first, the quality of the bamboo may not be uh, right, right. And second, the, 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 the resources are not yet. Yeah, bamboo grows fast. It doesn't mean that it cannot be affected. And also, for example, if, yeah, it's great to have the bamboo treatment facility, but if the treatment solution is not managed properly, then what is the impact of this? There are so many questions around it. And this can be uh, this, this uh, yeah, I think that sometimes these are not considered in a, um, as it should be. So it is how from the sector we can um, think out of the box, not as basic service providers, and consider all these all these considerations uh, in order to ensure that it is sustainable. The same case, and I don't have a case study here, but uh, we um, this is an, another example for another material. For example, air, the promotion of construction with air, which is a wonderful natural material, uh, but still, if we decide to use it, there are other considerations like soil erosion. Where is this? soil be taken from what can we if, if we don't, because if if we create ponds or we create and we we we, we provide uh, we we can if we don't control where it is sourced we we will have soil erosion and flooding with other not just uh, this not just floods but also other uh, other implications and it is not most of the cases it is not controlled or for example how the, the water that it's gonna, it, it is required for, for building with the uh, earth. And is, it, is it available? Will it limit the water sources? What is, so all these considerations that are not, uh, that sometimes are not um, assessed properly, I think, and, and, and evaluated through the process that I think that 
we should be taking into consideration when we are promoting it. But um, yeah, so still, uh, even if we know this, I know that uh, and from my experience, and I'm sure that most of you have experienced the same, how can we from shelter, as, as shelter practitioners, uh, support the sustainable forestry management within the program? Do we have the resources? Do we have the expertise? Uh, do we need to, to uh, join another sector to do that? Uh, so what, how, how can we make it happen? Or for, yeah, the, exactly the same, the supply, yeah, for in general, for the supply chain or for the treatment or, or, or also if we want to engage with the community, how can we, do we have the resources? Do we really uh, have the people required for that? Um, and maybe, uh, and what does it need to change? That's, uh, it's about uh, our mindset, it's about the, um, or it's about maybe the, the entire um, shelter sector proposal, um, um, template that we use always, which budget is focused on materials and which where donors are focused, especially in figures, people reach, and we just need to deliver and to build the shelters immediately and to distribute all the NFIs that we have. And we don't have, and, and we always, we, most of the times, if we are not, if it is not a holistic, and unless that it has other sectors within the program, it is very difficult to include this type of activities that requires um, more uh, resources, specific uh, expertise or uh, more staff or other type of resources. So I think that's, um, yeah, if there is a, this is the call for um, promotion of a change within the, within the sector approach. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if uh, we are going to have questions here now or, or we will leave the questions for later. Elisa. Okay, so I do have a question actually. <laughs> so yeah. I start with, um, actually, I was, I, I think that is very interesting that all the, you know, we talked before, and I really think that these consequences while promoting a sustainable solution, and you think it's sustainable, what is sustainable? We know. What is a sustainable solution and how you need to be circular, right? It can't be, you can't be sustainable if you're only thinking about a very specific or very short period of time or period of, or one specific sector. It's not, it's not sustainable. It can't be sustainable. So I think that um, the question that you was, uh, that we, that we are responding with the message uh, is very tricky. So the question is, how can we minimize the damage we cause to the environment while providing timely and possible humanitarian assistance? And what I was, I don't know, I want to hear a bit about, you know, from you, that is a kind of our specialist. Do you think we can, you know, timely, environmental, sustainable? I think that is, is, hmm. uh, for this, we, I think that we need to change our mindset maybe, and also, uh, yeah, it's true that sometimes you, well, also the natural disaster, na the nature of the natural disaster in the last years and in the coming years, it will be unpredictable. I think that we are not, and um, we are gonna face uh, really real difficulties to maybe be on the right place at the right moment and, and knowing the, the context, but still there is, and maybe this is also some a good idea for shelter projects because there, there are a lot of there is a lot of experience and a lot of case studies, and but sometimes it is unless you go to shelter projects and you start checking all the shelter projects edition, it is sometimes it's not. Uh, I think that it it, it could be more. Um, all these lessons learned could be more that maybe a compilation of lessons learned that can help to to uh, as soon as we arrive we without a, an open mindset we try to understand the contents see the lessons learned and discuss of course with the with the community and in, in, in involved with the community in, engage the community from the beginning because they know exactly what is happening there but uh, i think that there is a space for 
for that. And but we should be re taking out maybe our helmets of uh, architects and engineers and less technical skills and more soft skills, which actually are um, lacking in the sector, even if in other sectors, for example, WASH, which is very technical also, but they have specific soft activities. But in shelter sector, it is very difficult to have these soft, uh, soft uh, skills of soft activities or focus on that. And I think that if we, if we could uh, increase that and yeah, be open to and, and, and have an uh, access access to lessons learned from the context on the or similar context because also I think for example for bamboo, yeah, well Dave here he has been working with bamboo in, in so many contexts for so many years, but in the within the humanitarian sector and don't, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but up to the Bangladesh, it has not had this visibility and people humanitarian practitioners in general have not been digging into that unless you had like a special interest or particular interest, but the visibility and the, and the attention that has been paid to a bamboo as a sustainable material and shelter material, it has with the, with the case in Fox's Bazaar is where, when it has been also mostly considered and maybe because it's also uh, the environmental discussions have been, have been increasing, but, um, there is, and, and maybe the first people who arrived to that that um, that emergency, they didn't know bamboo. They have they didn't work before with bamboo, and we should have if we could have access to this knowledge uh, before and more. If there are there is information, there is knowledge that can be shared, uh, but it maybe it wasn't it wasn't accessible for them. And they struggle when they arrive there. They, didn't, they never worked before with bamboo. So what? And where can they get the information? And um, yeah, again, they uh, they will have uh, trained everyone. <laughs> but but, but this, anyway, uh, I think that um, it's about changing our mindset. And uh, maybe yeah, maybe we could work together on a better comp uh, not not a better but more like guide. But shelter projects is wonderful, but maybe uh, from shelter projects have like an easy, easy way to, to filter and to have more like a clear compilation of guidance where the people could access that could be that could be super good. Um, not sure if in a website way or and with translation also to different languages to, to more languages so um, it is accessible for people and um, I think that that can help. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I definitely agree. And I think now we're starting overlapping with Dave's content, which is great. It means that we're in the perfect. It means that we're in the right way. I don't know, Dave, you prefer to present now or you jump to Maya and then go back to you? Um, how do you prefer? I'm happy to step in now and I'm also just happy to add to those comments before about um, Bangladesh a little bit and that's mm -hmm. to say that um, really uh, one of the biggest challenges in our sector is the sort of cannon, cannon fodder um, human resource mentality where we just have such high turnover in the sector and we're very, very poor at knowledge management. Um, you know, we, 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 we bring in people, we burn them out, we throw them out and there's not that many permanent positions in our sector. Uh, you know, I remember being involved in an analysis done by the um, the, the Queen of Qatar Commission to look at the humanitarian capacity needs of the shelter, uh, the capacity, capacity strengthening needs of the humanitarian shelter sector. And, uh, you know, it's really, really clear that there's just not that many long-term professionals in our sector and knowledge management is really poor. And I think that uh, Shelter Projects is an important, one important tool in that process. But, you know, what's really happened uh, in Costa Bazaar is every time there's a major disaster that uses a lot of bamboo, everybody runs around, learns a lot of bamboo, and then most of those people leave the sector, everybody else forgets. New people are sent in, they've got no idea. Uh, it, you know, bamboo is the major uh, material that was used in the George Cutter earthquake in 2006. It was a major material used in uh, Timor in the Timor response in 99. It was, you know, the, it goes back and goes back and goes back. And it's always stunning if you meet some of the really old dinosaurs of the sector. And they'll tell you the same conversation about cocoa lumber and they'll tell you the same conversation about stone and mud, the same conversation, you know. You know, um, yeah, so, um, you know, I, I uh, yeah, I, and definitely, you know, Cox's Bazaar, people walked in and there was no awareness that uh, 
actually a major paper mill had just closed in the area that was using bamboo as its fiber source. And that that meant there was a flood of available bamboo in the region um, as a temporary blip because of the closure of a factory. And that nobody had any awareness of that or what of, of what species they were even using. They were just had to get some people undercover. Um, so yeah, that's a challenge for our sector. Um, and so thanks for raising that. I think it's, it's uh, you know, technical, um, and I think also the perception of technical skills, which you raised, I'll, I'll speak to that a bit further as I go along, but um, I'm a technical shelter expert. I'm happy to sort of comfortably say that after 20 or 30 years in the sector, but that doesn't mean I'm an engineer or an architect or, a, you know, an urban planner, or these are different skills. Each one is different. We're prone not to recognise that being a specialist at sheltering affected populations is a particular technical skill. Um, and we tend to think of soft and hard. And actually, it's just actually sheltering affected populations, ensuring safety, dignity, comfort, transition, uh, sustainability, climate disability. This is a technical skill of itself. And we've got very few universities that train on it and very few, little focus on it, very little capacity building in the sector. So I just wanted to touch on those. But um, I'm, that does lead in well to what, uh, what I was going to look at. And um, so, you know, we'll just jump into the first slide. Um, I'm actually just going to jump through. Um, I could have looked at some more recent stuff that I've been involved in, but I thought this would be interesting just to look at um, our understanding of this question, which is, do we have the skills to understand and incorporate risk analysis in our programs, particularly in terms of local indigenous knowledge? So this this is an image that, that I took in um, Bang in uh, the Nepal earthquake, and these were two houses that were about 50 metres apart. Um, one fell down, one didn't. Why? Um, both built in stone and mud. Um, so just click ahead. Um, next. I don't have control of this, so. Mm, is that changing? It's not changing for me. Oh yeah. So really what happened after the earthquake, um, you had this massive push to build back safer. And you fly in all these experts and, um, you know, really we're experts because we trained under a building code in our country, in, in our context, uh, in, you know, knowing the resources that we know how to use. And there's this massive push that we've got to build back. So safer means steel and concrete, like proper building. You've got to do proper building. Um, if you just click again, uh, just get you to you can click through these just one at a time, but not sure who's got the control here. I do, maybe there's a bit of delay. Oh uh, yeah, so you might've clicked through two or three slides. Yeah, that's, that's all right. Um, so yeah, you, there does seem to be a bit of a delay, but you know, it, it was really clear when you looked at Nepal, it wasn't stone and mud versus concrete and steel, it wasn't a clear picture. These, you had some amazing buildings built out of stone and um, concrete and um, steel, and that wasn't what was making something safer. Uh, that wasn't the issue. Uh, changing material technology. I think 101 in an engineering course is how to get an egg and chuck it out of a really tall building and make some structure out of matchsticks or paper or something that will stop the egg from breaking. You know, we, we know that we can build earthquake resistant structures or risk re uh, resilient structures out of anything, out of glass, out of paper, out of bamboo, out of straw. It's changing technology is just not the answer. That's not why things fell down. We just click ahead one slide, one click, see if we get there. And in fact, if you want, you can just sort of click once every 30, 40 seconds and I'll catch up with you. Um, yeah, that one. So this okay. is a good example where, where we can see, we can see um, a build, one building fell down, one building didn't, They're right next to each other. Why? Why, what was the difference? Clearly probably built by the same person. What was the difference? In this case, it was the veranda. Uh, which is an odd thing to think about. But do, do we have the analytical skills? How many people in our sector have the analytical skills to come and say, oh, that veranda made a big difference to the building? And then why? Why did it make a big difference? So if you click again. Um, you could, it, it doesn't wanna, yeah, no, wrong direction. Yeah, so this is again just an image of concrete and steel uh, that I was saying that's not, you know, clearly um, introducing concrete and steel wasn't necessarily the solution. Um, just, just click one more time. That's interesting that this is not um, working. So 
yeah, this is again, um, you know, where we can see these buildings that were, this is, these are buildings that are hundreds of years old that have stood up through multiple earthquakes, um, perfectly made, stone and mud, perfectly unaffected. Uh, you know, so you can, you sort of, if you start looking around, you start going, well, what's wrong with vernacular traditional housing? You know, it, it, it you know, nothing, like it worked. Um, that's a three-story building. It just went through a mega earthquake. Um, what's the problem? You just click again. And why did that one uh, stand up? You know, I guess that's the question that you have to start to ask. When we start to look at brick failure, you start to see, well, there's these bands of timber that are holding those buildings. There's half a dozen things. And we went through and we made a document on the reasons that stone and mud buildings fell down and we produced some information on it. But there was one particular thing there, which was this timber banding that you can see in the walls there. And you can see in the, both those examples where the timber band that is wrapping around the buildings failed. And that's caused the builder building to fail. You know, Stone and mud structures are great. Um, they're really, really strong. If you either lean them in or you tie them together. If you haven't tied them, if you haven't tied them together, they'll fall apart. But traditional stone buildings in Nepal with traditional wood um, banding worked quite well uh, in the earthquake. So we we'll click again. Um, we will sort of see uh, this is you know that when we sort of start to investigate and we sort of say well, how do you do that banding and we look at the jointing techniques that they've got that's a wedged uh, Japanese banding technique that um, is used commonly in Nepal it's it's a great technique it works really well I could improve it a little bit because you know I can see that there's a potential split line there's two split lines down the middle there but it's obeying the third 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 world principle which is a sort of fundamental carpentry principle it's a wedge joint it's resisting uh, tension you know, they're doing a pretty good job like that's that's not bad you could see that those other joints that i looked at didn't do that they one of them was just a lap joint um uh one of them was a, a, a vertical pin joint and and they weren't up to that standard so you could see that there was capacity not everybody was being able to do that if we jump ahead a slide um yeah when we start having a discussion and i walk around the villages and say horizontal banding in your walls um uh did you do that um did you do it in your house is that why your house fell down people are like oh, i don't know what you're talking about um this doesn't make any sense what do you mean banding we don't use banding in our house i couldn't even find the words to talk about it until eventually i stumbled across this poster beside the road on the right hand side there which is a, a um for the annual snake festival which celebrates the tensile strength of snakes and those things are called snakes. They're, people think of them as a snake and they're put into the wall for a spiritual reason. They're, they're embedded there. Um, there's a belief system that this is what's gonna protect, protect our house. These snakes that were put in the wall. How we got to that point, how that evolved, whether there was anybody who ever thought about it scientifically or it just occurred and then it got copied because those buildings stood up, we'll never know. It's way back in time. But this is a fundamental, you know, people celebrate this National Stake Festival to celebrate the safety of their houses. Uh, so this knowledge is there, but it's couched in Indigenous language, Indigenous, um, you know, when we look at things like... Uh, I'm just losing my word, but uh, that, that feng shui, it's capturing a whole bunch of language about what makes buildings comfortable and what makes them thermally enjoyable, um, but it's couching them in language about dragons and spirits and stuff, but the concepts are there, and this is the same. This is a concept that's protected houses, couched in different language. Because it's couched in different language, it's not something written in the building code. A lot of, when we bring in engineers and architects, it's really hard for them to wrap their head around that and say, oh, that makes sense. Now, this becomes a bit of our problem. If you just click again, you're welcome to click and just push me to talk. Uh, yeah, so you end up with this. You end up with these crazy weird experts coming in um, and trying to find, we've got a problem in our sector is finding enough people who are gonna stay around long enough and get that gray hair that that guy's got and be crazy enough to climb into buildings and keep climbing into buildings in, in disasters. Um, not fall in love and where to get a job at headquarters, not, you know, get married, have kids and leave, not, you know, all the other stuff. We have a, we have this um, problem of, of so if we're going to ensure that we have the technical capacity to really look at vernacular architecture and traditional buildings and make these determinations about what was working, what wasn't, uh, what can be strengthened and what can't, then we need better knowledge management systems and we need better skills at retention and training of staff in the sector um, because we don't have enough um, 
of shelter technical experts. We have a lot of engineering technical experts and a lot of architectural experts, but we don't have enough shelter technical experts. And it's this weird crossover that uh, that Eva spoke spoke about. So we just click ahead again. So yeah, click again. I just wanted to just quickly look at some good and bad practices. Uh, so this is this is uh, where you get a perfect technical solution. Oh, sorry, just click back again. You've jumped ahead too fast. It, yeah, so this is just where you can see you're getting um, a classic, uh, you know, this is an NGO called Dome for the World that came into Indonesia after the Jogjakarta earthquake. Um, there was a displaced community, so they got hold of a piece of rice field and built a whole bunch of domes. Um, concrete domes. I don't know if any of you have ever been inside a concrete dome in the tropics. It's really, really, really hot and it's really stifling. There's no air movement and there was no land tent, low, no individual land tent you sorted out. Oh, it's a communal society. They can figure it out together. So nobody can buy or sell out of that community. Everybody's trapped in that community. So if you just click one more time, uh, you'll see that that photo I took in 2007, just soon after the earthquake. And this is the photo that I took uh, 2015. You can see that dome starting to fall apart, but still reinforcing the concrete cracking, a massive problems with humidity build up on the inside. If you sweat, all that humidity piles up in the ceiling, uh, very moldy. Um, I had, you know, we went and interviewed families there, our parents complaining that they could have no intimate lifestyle because um, the sound of even kissing their wife echoed around the walls of the room and of that entire house. They're like a, a, a coic chamber. Um, you can see also that people have built, you've got this massive tectonically strong building smashing against a very soft, flexible piece of indigenous architecture. And actually, whoever's in either of them is at increased risk. Um, these buildings weren't built to be extended to, to be part of somebody's living journey of their life. So just click one more time. So this is where we see bad practice, right? Now I'm cheating here. I don't know why that's showing up faint but we'll ignore it but that's my restaurant oh yeah it came through that's my restaurant um and in i live in a small village and and uh this is a building an old uh, historical building that i've renovated so i just thought i'd use it to zoom in on one little detail so if we click again just once uh, we can zoom in um yeah and i guess i almost have a question for everybody why is that that shape does can anybody tell me why that's that shape what is its function? It's a it's a heritage bit of architecture. It's there for a reason, or is it just because it's cute? Anybody got a comment? Um, I think it's not because it's cute. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Lena, okay. Go. I'm not sure about the answer, but as I remember, as we studied in um, history of architecture, th there was a reason of distributing the um, weight uh, to the ground, and it's something maybe related to um, this issue. I'm not sure. Something physical. <laughs> Yeah. So, okay. So, Lenny, you're not correct, but you're on the right track, which is that it's got a reason. You know, it's got a reason. And and when you come in, you could just look at that and go, "Oh, that's cute." But it, actually, it's a termite. It's a termite cap. So, you, it's it does two things. One, it's getting the timber off the ground to stop the bottom of the timber rotting. So, um, and often the very top edge is beveled so that water will drain away. It's not in this particular case, but termites can't get through that solid piece of stone. They've got to build a tunnel up the outside. And as they try to build on that sloped edge, the tunnel collapses. And even if they got first, past the first one, they wouldn't get past the second one. It would definitely collapse. So it's it's a termite proofing. This is a termite cap and a, and a damp proof cap. Uh, and it's integral to the structure. If, if I, I, I know that, I've worked on the termite card of Australia and, you know, I know that from, in, from studying about termites and buildings and blah, 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 blah. I know its function uh, very well. But when I, when I go around Jogjakarta, which where this building is, and I ask traditional um, builders, traditional architects, anybody in the community, I can't find anybody who knows about that. Nobody knows why they do it. They're doing it because that's what their family always did. Um, that's the way you build things. And so you've got to recognize that this, um, this evolved knowledge isn't necessarily using the scientific rhyme and reason that we're thinking about, but it's still of value. That's an incredibly effective termite crap. And it's a great way to get your timber out of the, out, out of the rot. So just click ahead again.
So this is, um, and you can click one more time. This is a, a, a building that uh, I came across in Nepal. I just looked down from above and thought, wow, that's an interesting building. And I'll climb down and had a look. So here's a second question for everybody. Why did they do that? That's the eaves of the building. Um, the rafters coming out. Why? Why is that shaped like that? Anybody got an idea? We want to have a stab in the dark. Maybe not. I got to have a drink in the meanwhile. But basically, that's that prevents water running back down the underside of the rafter and then tripping down the side of the wall. It's, it creates drip points. And again, it's you see it all the time in architecture. You see it very commonly in knee bracings where they'll have, and normally there'll be two drip points that are created for, for safety. And this has got these very two clear drip points. Water cannot possibly run along the bottom side of that rafter and reach that wall. It will not make the wall rot. The water will drip away, protecting the building. Now, you, you just look at that and think, you know, if you don't have those eyes, you walk in and you look at that, it's cute. I wonder, look at that. They built this very simplistic building with minimalist architecture and not very much money. And then they went to all this effort doing this really complex detail. Now, if you ask the people why, they're not going to tell you that it was for drip reasons, for water protection reasons. That's absolutely the function that it does. But they're going to say, well, that's what my granddad did, or that's the right way to do it, or, you know, different reasons. They're not necessarily going to know the reason that was there. So, you know, when you come back to that question is, do we have the skills and abilities to check this stuff? We can, and those that exists, but we need to think about it and be trained on it and look at it uh, with very different eyes to traditional building code eyes. In our building code, we designed the rafters so that they the water can't run up there anyway. Uh, the building is designed so that can't occur. But in traditional architecture, this is a very common solution. So we just click again. So I guess um, what I really want to answer with that, that question with is, you know, um, you can see the technically appropriate solutions only work if they're socially appropriate. Those domes don't work. They're, they're, they're just not socially appropriate. They're in culturally, climatically, so many different ways they're going to progress. We've got to sort of recognise the difference between evolved knowledge and scientifically acquired knowledge and know that they're equally valid and try to sort of recognise that some, just because somebody's got some evolved knowledge doesn't mean they know from a scientific point of view why they're doing something, but it still could well be correct. It could be wrong, but it could also be correct and we need to learn from it. Um, I remember going into the cyclones in uh, in the Philippines and great debates about pitches of roofs and uh, what pitch of roof was best to handle a cyclone. And there was a great debate to the point where one NGO was going to go and get some wind tunnel testing done and they commissioned the university to wind, wind tunnel testing. And I was sort of like, well, we just wind tunnel tested a million houses. We can't walk around with a camera and figure out the answer. There's something wrong with us all. So there's this somehow not getting too trapped in our technical scientific approach and taking more of a vernacular open-eyed approach can really help us along the way but we do have to have technical specialists who can develop the skills to analyze um, and value vernacular uh, architecture vernacular technology um, i think fundamentally it's recognizing that um, we've got to stop being us designing for them this is this sort of fundamental diatribe that we've got stuck in it's us providing shelter solutions for you um when you know it's not actually our house it's not our life it's not our disaster uh, what are we doing like you know where do you want to go where do you imagine yourself being in 10 years time your house got destroyed what was your plan for your family in 10 years time and what are the little bits and pieces that i could do to help you get there um, what can I learn from your traditional architecture? What's working, what's not? What can I add a little bit and nudge it a bit? And can I sort of guide you a bit? And that's about it. That's really where we need to be operating. Not the I design a shelter for you. That, that, that model is dead duck and we've got to get out of it. And it's really hard in a sector where we have very poor HR uh, management and long-term careers. So jump ahead one. Next. So I, I just thought I'd drop this slide up. I'm not going to read it all, um, but you can. You're all sitting in the background. This is basically at the top is what I see as the job description of a shelter specialist. A technical shelter specialist isn't an architect. It's not an engineer. You, um, the example I always give uh, or often give is that if a major earthquake happened in Jakarta and a million people were homeless, probably the best shelter solution is to buy them a bus ticket because most 
of in, to, people in Jakarta are used to traveling home for Idul Fitri to the village where they come from, to Mudik, and to go spend time with their families there. It's probably the easiest, cheapest shelter solution is buying a bus ticket. And that's valid shelter solution. It's a completely valid shelter solution. It ensures adequacy of shelter, ensures that they're living in safety, with dignity, in comfort. And as long as we can make sure that they don't get stuck out there and they don't lose all their assets back home and they get access to aid moving forward, we can ensure a transition onto a future, better sustainable future. That's our job. I also just want to clarify that these are the four questions that I ask when I come into a disaster. This really, these really are the real questions that I ask whenever I come into a disaster. And I start with priority shelter needs, who's not on cover now and needs it. But the big question for me is why somebody couldn't achieve this on their own? In every one of those questions, it's what are the barriers and how do I overcome, help people overcome those? And I honestly believe the answer to being a shelter practitioner is knowing the questions to ask. It's not knowing the answers. It's about coming in with open eyes, knowing what questions to ask, looking at stuff with a very open attitude and not thinking you're an expert. Um, thinking that, you know, I'm here to learn and I'm here to hear from you and understand from you. So we just click on the next slide. So these are the messages that were that are written uh, into the shuttle projects. And I guess what I wanted to do is come back after that and say, well, are they correct? People build their homes in their ways, um, ways incorporating methods and old traditions. Well, phew, you know, um, you build your house out of bamboo with thatched walls and a cyclone comes along, the wind blows through the walls um, and the thatch stays up and then eventually the wind gets stronger and the thatching on the roof blows away, but the frame's still there. The wind gets a bit longer, stronger, the thatched, the, the woven bamboo walls blow away, but the frame's still there. Gets even stronger, the roof frame blows away, but the frame's still there. Gets even stronger, the frame blows away, but the posts are still there, you know, um, and then there's not much, and then you just come back and you build it all out of traditional materials. It's a great solution until storms get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, things get more powerful and nasty. And also until you've got a fridge and a laptop and, you know, all those clothes you've got to wear to work. And, you know, and this vernacular architecture wasn't um, protecting you against the changing nature of risk. And it wasn't protecting you uh, um, against the changing needs of your lifestyle. So you adopt some new materials and you clad the walls in, um, in plywood and you put some... Um, corrugated iron on the roof and your fridge is safe and your, and your laptop is safe, but you've got no realization that now you're, you've radically increased the vacuum that your building is creating, the suction on your building has gone up greatly. So there's sometimes we need to come in and say, well, which parts of your vernacular architecture and traditional buildings were working really well? You've got these new materials and methods, but how are you connecting them? What's my job? helping you understand that and helping you connect that. It's not my job to design you another house or build you another house or define your future and trajectory to tell you must have corrugated iron or you must do this, not at all. My job is just to help you bridge and understand that putting that piece of plywood on there instead of that piece of bamboo, uh, woven bamboo sheeting has radically increased the wind load on your building. And now you need to think about how to design joints and resist um, being pulled apart, not just but risk, resist the compression of, of gravity. And, and then I can have that conversation and say, you know, all your joints in your house, they're really good at gravity, but now we've got a corrugated iron roof, it's lifting up. Can you change that joint in some way so that it resists being lifted up? What have you got? What materials have you got? Do you understand the problem? What can you do? And that can be enough. We don't need to. Uh, so it's sort of that delicate balance of utilizing traditional vernacular knowledge and materials, but um, helping people adapt to these changing contexts of risk and uh, increased uh, and changing lifestyle. I think they're both really important. Um, I completely agree with the statement number two, the unknown methods, really risky, but they're there. You walk into communities full of asbestos and corrugated iron and all this other stuff, and you've got to help people know how to deal with that. So it's not that we're not, um, not introducing those unknown methods, but often it's a case of us helping people understand the risks and the methodologies that connect to those methods, those new methods. Um, I definitely agree with the, it's all about markets. I think that generally our sector um, has a poor perception, of, poor perception of that. We walk in and go, oh, but the markets are destroyed, so we'll have to buy stuff. 
um, instead of going, oh, what were the blockages to the markets? How do we take a market intervention solution where we fix the ferry terminal or the bridge or whatever it is that's stopping the market's function and, or, or help those suppliers connect to a better supplier um, and go in that direction. Um, so I guess uh, that I'd all come out of all of that and say, local approaches, as much as possible, minimal change theory, um, you like building your house in stone and mud, go for it. I've got no problem with that. Can we see any stone and mud houses that worked well? Great. Did we see any stone house houses that didn't work well? Why did they fail? What was the difference? Let's take some photos. Let's talk about it. How can you do that and not do that? How can I help you better do this and not this? That's my job. You want to build in bamboo? Same job. You want to build in coconut timber? Same job. You want to build in bricks, single brick construction, you want to build a confined masonry, whatever it is you, your family want to build in, my job and rebuilding, my job isn't to define that for you, to talk up, to define the shape, the size, the colour, the material of your house. My job is to help you on your journey achieve a more sustainable long-term outcome and to, to, be, to understand the range of possible technologies and engage in a conversation with you around it. Um, and then people are managing their own house, their own future. I'd say the single biggest thing that slows down disaster response on the planet is people sitting around waiting for aid and scared to miss out and scared that they may do the right, wrong thing. Uh, and I think that just being there and helping people on that journey and informing them and helping them recover themselves is what we need to be much more focused on. Oh, David, forward. do love that you are now moving to Amaya's topic, that is the resilience. So <laughs> it's uh, thank, yeah, no, it, it was really amazing. And I do think that um, is, it is very interesting how the topics are still, you know, getting one into the other, to the next one. Um, we do not have much more time now, 15 minutes, so I might need you to compress as much as possible. Um, and maybe if people still have some time after for a round of uh, questions, that would be great. Um, so I might leave the floor for you, um, around 15 minutes if you can. Or if you can, yeah, like extra 10 minutes for questions, that would be great. Thank you. Good afternoon, and, and thanks for inviting me. Sorry to be a bit late, complicated day today. Um, I will try to be as, as brief as possible and just to explain that uh, what I'm going to explain is not necessarily uh, under a humanitarian scene. But anyway, I was asked to explain this <laughs> exotic <laughs> problem uh, and severe problem related to permafrost, and, and I, am, um, I am going to, to do it. So first, um, I think as the, as the key measures, it's about if or whether good projects reduce the impacts of, of future shocks, for, for sure, yes. But uh, I think uh, first, shelter and settlements assistance can support people to build resilience, not only to future shocks, but also to future stresses. And, and, uh, but what does it mean, uh, shocks and stresses? Because sometimes we, the, the terms have to become a bit confusing. And I would like to, to begin explaining what are these terms from, from the UN Habitat perspective, that uh, it's more or less as usual, but not exactly that. And it has to do with the actions that come after understanding what shocks and stresses is. Um, the shocks are um, uncertain, abrupt, and, and, and long onset events. And briefly in my, in my words, it's something that is external to the scene, to the scenario we are working with. And if we are um, talking specifically about urban settings, as usually uh, we work with in, uh, from UN Habitat, it's something that we have to be ready we have to be prepared, but we don't know where it, where it comes to come. We know it will come and we have to be prepared. While stresses are chronic and ongoing, these functionalities that are within the system and the action that we need to, to address is different because perhaps we have not the resources, we have not the means, but usually, technically speaking, mm, we know how to address the problem. And this really makes a difference because sometimes when you talk with the local authority and you mix and you combine shocks and stresses and, and you are talking of risks uh, from this general perspective, they get, uh, some, they get confused and they don't know how to address, how to act. And, uh, and this uh, dichotomy of shocks and stresses uh, on this way, I think uh, facilitates and make it easier to act against both. Okay, so this is, this is first. 
uh, if there is a way to respond and understand the sad needs of, of the people and the planet, this way comes from knowledge. And, uh, and we need to think, and I, th and I, I, I know the other uh, colleagues have already explained it, we need to think uh, holistically and, and act systematically. Okay, we, we were talking before about the settle, center and settlement assistance support people to build resilience um, to future shocks and stresses. What is urban resilience? Well, for you and Habitat, uh, you, you have the, um, the definition on the screen. I am not going to read it again, but it's true that to build resilience, we need to count on people. You see there the word inhabitant, not only citizen, it's inhabitant and it's not by chance. Uh, and we need to, to count uh, on a multi-stakeholder point of view. Uh, Dave was also talking about that. We need to include local governments and multi-level governance schemes when we are uh, working uh, in urban settings. And all, of course, we need to count on a multifunctional and multi-sectoral approach because it's shelter, yes, but it's not only about shelter. Shelter, it's at the core, but we need to accompany uh, our shelter solutions within other uh, schemes around it. And uh, when we talk of success stresses, we usually forget uh, another work I am very used to, to working with, that is the word challenges, that uh, precisely is totally related with the, with the conversation today. It's about contextual or environmental changes that have uh, the potential to impact upon the ability or capacity. Um, we talk usually about vulnerability. I, I prefer to talk about capacity or the lack of it because vulnerability is an intersectional concept. It's not an, an, as, an state, uh, a situation, it's an stage, so you can change it. And, uh, and we are here understanding the scenario to change and to shift from vulnerability to capacity. The shocks are not only natural, even if we are used to, to work with natural shocks, I am, I am pretty aware of it, but the shocks upon them built upon the taxonomy of, of UNDRR go beyond. And we need to talk about societal, technological now more than ever, biological, remember the COVID uh, complex when, when they come out together and natural and environmental that perhaps are the shocks that we are more used to, to, to dealing with. And these challenges, these new challenges of migration and climate change, not shocks because we are talking about people and about the planet. So it's not shocks, it's not stresses, it's a new challenge. And stresses, so internal dysfunctionalities that are related with these big shocks. Um, when we are talking of societal, we can talk in urban settings, settings about concentrated poverty or gender inequality. Well, you have there on the screen. And some of them as the lack of alternative energy and water resources or the inadequate ecosystem performance is totally linked to these uh, um, concerns we have now about climate change and the, the further climate actions we need to undertake. I will explain very, in a very brief uh, three slides, <laughs> uh, the case of Yakusk again, uh, explaining that it's not a humanitarian scenario, but it's a, 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 a city at risk. In, in, in Siberia is the, is the biggest uh, city built on permafrost. Permafrost, as uh, perhaps you know, it's um, below our, our, our feet, uh, 10 meters below our feet. When you are on the permafrost, you have frozen soil. And this frozen soil um, is melting, uh, is thawing before of the climate change and also because, because of technogenic pressure, which means because of the way <laughs> humans are, are, are touching and are, are working with the, with the environment. And uh, I don't know if you are used to, to, to listening to the news, but every spring and every summer, uh, we listen that in Siberia, we have these forest fires and we have these very, very high temperatures every time more and more that are really um, uh, um, rendering uh, cities as a really fragile uh, in the face of the of the climate change, but um, uh, if you um, if we have a look to the built environment, and it has to do with uh, Dave's um, narrative, uh, we could see the traditional buildings uh, made in 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 wood, 
uh, birds, good, that it's indeed a, a very important and it's within all the, all the mythics of the, of, the, of, the, of the beliefs of the people from Yakutsk. But uh, at the same time, these um, buildings were very light and were working on the permafrost. They were touching the surface. And when in winter we use the ovens, um, we are facing um, many situations of different uh, urban fi fires. So they decided to shift from this uh, bird's good to concrete and I would say business as usual way of, of, of working with, with buildings, uh, multi-story buildings, but um, thinking perhaps that they were making it better, but they forgot some of the traditional knowledge and, and the reason why we were uh, building on, on wood. And now you can see how um, many of these buildings are crushed because of the of the foundation of the of the buildings are not are not working. Um, the urban built fabric infrastructure and public spaces and facilities are under pressure by these shops, stresses and, and the challenges that that are triggering uh, this critical environment and are really um, uh, putting the, the the civil society under a critical um, situation. So what's the solution if there is any? Well, so far, uh, what we have uh, discovered is that we need to change rules and, regula and regulations, that the, um, the um, security coefficients needs to be changed, that perhaps some of the insurance schemes also for uh, professionals need also to be changed, that we need the space uh, between the building itself and the soil to protect the permafrost. That, as you see in the in the picture, we need to work with this disaster reduction of air ducts and thermosiphons to ensure that the permafrost is protected and that we are refrigerating the building foundation to avoid uh, more problems. And um, as Dave was explaining before, and also Eva, uh, we need to go. We need to think a bit beyond uh, not only the techniques and try to combine, if possible. Um, the innovative eco-design measures and materials that uh, that um, people that are living there already know, <laughs> because it's not only about uh, about techniques; it's also about um, identity and uh, about to to build a city that 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 is linked to our culture and our way of of living. And, and I think this in many cities I know we are we have forgotten. And, um, and well, innovative eco design measures and materials must be there uh, to ensure and enhance, and enhance the, the, the urban fabric. And, and we, we need to take into consideration, um, as for the permafrost, everything that has to do with energy, with water, with materials, with environmental quality, of course, with waste and, 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 and resources. And um, the, as always in resilience, we need to see to, to, to transfer any crisis in an opportunity, even if it could sound a bit naive. And, uh, and now I think the city is trying to, to, see a, to, 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 to be a reference as for permafrost, even despite all the difficulties. So I respect a lot of uh, people that are trying to work there to make it better and to, and to learn how to, how to do from, from here to the future. And with this, I, I finish. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Amaya. I really think that um, very interesting when we have so different examples, so different case studies, when you talk about messages and we are saying that the message can apply in different ways, in different scenarios, but um, how even the, the, the topics that you're talking today are really overlapping so many ways and with completely different contexts, completely different backgrounds. And I really like when we connect also with Eva was saying, like if you have, uh, you need to, to have a cycle for everything. You know, you need to close the cycle. You need to do, um, um, of the solutions need to be circular. So this is something that in the urban environment is even more hard to understand how to close the circle. Because in when you're talking about bamboo and you can't realize how this, and if, how can you close the, the, a circle a more realistic, but circular solution and it's very, it's harder to think on an urban. And I do think that in general, we do like to, to, to think more on how this would, um, would happen in our urban environment. So I, I know that there are 
we are about to finish our time. Um, if you still have time for a couple of questions, um, I would invite the, the participants if you want to send some comments or um, message or, or questions, you can raise your hands, you can put in the chat. I do see that we already have a question in the chat from Taylor. Um, Taylor, do you want to open a mic and ask? Yeah, um, sure. Hi. It was more of just a comment. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed the, the presentations. Thanks, everyone. The first one, specifically when Eva was talking about the supply chain, um, yeah, I just would, would echo it's it's such an important part of uh, reducing the, the carbon footprint, especially. So some of the stats I posted there, like 60% of humanitarian organizations, carbon emissions are generally from supply chain. And then within that, 70% is from the extraction of the materials for, for the goods and from the manufacturing process. So it just goes back to the proper planning and, and selection of items, focusing on local items. And really working with the procurement colleagues to try to get the the most environmentally friendly items um so yeah that was kind of the main comment i'm not sure if there's any shelter projects that really focus on supply chain but i think it'd be great to show how uh, good good examples of how to integrate supply chain planning into shelter projects early on in the planning phase yeah we do have one system that is uh, based on market basis and we are do, we are pushing to to understand more about it so how these, um, how the market will influence in the response, how it influence in the quality of the house, how it influence in this um, circular solutions and the, the supply chain and everything. Thank you, Taylor. Do you have more questions? Yes, in, indeed, in, in, uh, in Yakutsk, I had no time to explain it, but it's one of the most remote, um, remote cities within the world. So it's really, really, really difficult uh, to get materials um, put there. There are several solutions now ongoing to try to solve it. And uh, one of the, of the most weird um, <clears throat> issues when you go there is if they have the good, um, even understanding that we have to, to go for an environmental and, and <clears throat> circular solution, but if they have always have the good that is there, why they are using other kind of materials that perhaps are not the most interesting, uh, you know, and, and this is a, a big contradiction, precisely in a city where it's so difficult to get, uh, uh, to get materials because it's only by plane that you can get there. And uh, during uh, one part of the, of, the, of the summer season, you can go there by, by the river, but not during the, the year because they pass from minus 60 degrees Celsius to plus 40. So it's really a very extreme um, climatic situation. And even though they are working with concrete and, and this kind of um, conventional and, and not uh, um, local materials, that's it. Thanks. Over. Dave, Eva, do you want to jump in? Yeah, look, um, if it's okay, I'd, I'd love to make a comment, which is that, you know, again, I'd come back to it and say, you know, it, we can't always do it. Um, there's there's really unique circumstances where we can't, but as much as possible, where we can step back and not be the um, not be the be the people with the answers, not people be the people with the set design. You know, I, I used to own an environmental building company years ago, and um, you know, I used to always say to people, people would say, oh, I want to design a, a pre-design an environmental um, kit home. But, um, you know, I'd meet endless amount of people who had this new theory of an environmentally friendly kit home that they're going to just plonk into the landscape. And it's like, well, yeah, but every single family is different. Every piece of land is different. The climate is different. The building regulations are different. The wind direction is different. The solar orientation is different. How can that be? The locally available resources are different. The locally available materials are different. The capacities of that family are different how can you have one product that's going to do that? And as soon as you do, whatever it is, you make a million of them, you've got an environmental problem. You've got a shortage of something. You know, once we consider and allow and encourage diversity, um, I think we get to much more sustainable solutions much more quickly. Uh, there are unique circumstances. We're trapped in Bangladesh. We've, we're in a camp. We're not allowed outside that boundary and we're only allowed to use temporary materials. It's a regulated circumstance that we have to cope with. So they, they exist. But... Actually, if you want to build something sustainable, mimic nature. And it's all about diversity. It's, you know, that's the solution. 
uh, the more you know, I recently wrote an article uh, in, a, in a journal um, where we said that you know actually the best way to measure a successful shelter program would be by its invisibility, uh, by by how much you couldn't see it afterwards, how much it just blended into the community, how much it fitted the needs of different families and different circumstances using different materials and different agendas, but then also don't not dropping the fact that it's got to be strong and sustainable and comfortable and climatically you know suitable and affordable and all those other things but actually it's it's a very different approach I think that we need to take um, when we take that I have designed the solution approach we're stuck in a supply chain nightmare and we're stuck in a mass consumption nightmare and we sort of can't get out um, we're sort of making the rod to beat ourselves um, so I think you know we keep saying that shelter is a process not a product and yet we keep designing products uh, we keep getting trapped into that um, thing instead of just designing processes, solutions that are process oriented, um, that empower and enable people to recover. Yeah, this, thank you. That, this actually connects a lot with the comment that you just had in the chat from Magdalena. I don't know if you want to open your mic. I think that it's very pertinent what you're saying. And uh, when you only talk about locally available materials, but we're not really talking about the material, not talk about where's the materials coming from. Um, Madeline, do you want yeah. to open it? Okay. Yes, thank you. So what I was uh, mentioning in the chat is uh, how we, we in fact, I'm not in shelter, I'm in camp management right now, but shelter actors are highlighting that shelter materials are locally available, and this is true, but it's the women who are going to get these materials from the flood water, and I've listed uh, some of the risks that I know of, but I, there might be more, and those include leopards on the trees, snakes that are either dangerous or very dangerous, crocodiles, uh, uh, what's known as the guinea worm, uh, the theft of their machetes while they're on the way, the risk of rape because it's a significant walking distance, um, and that's to get the firewood, the reeds, the poles uh, that's, that are used for uh, for shelter construction. And uh, the surprising uh, uh, the surprising response on the other end is how, or this current uh, behavior in the humanitarian sector across sectors is that we are we are aware so that that's the answer that I get. Yes, we're aware of that. We know that that's what's happening with the women and we're taking a, a quite a powerless uh, position when there are many options that have been tried with communities where women are much more hesitant to work and much more reserved and much less, uh, so where we don't see this uh, existing, uh, these existing capacities. So we're currently working with economic recovery, GBV, site development, WASH, and shelter, and with anyone, any projects that have cash for work for short term uh, solutions to reduce these risks. And the women have suggested some solutions like uh, providing canoes that there are also longer term, more sustainable solutions that we can work on. On the other end, uh, donors could be could also play a big role in that, in setting a condition in their next call for proposals in South Sudan to demonstrate how will shelter, wash, uh, site development, and other actors contribute to reducing the risk on women across these sectors in a sustainable manner and fund that in, a, in longer term. Uh, Option. I hope that summarizes uh, the uh, quick and painful uh, risks that these women are facing in a quick and painful way. Yeah, no, I think that that was great, and it's really on the, on what we're saying about the process, right? We are not talking if you only if you only think about the moment that you have the materials and the moment that you finish building the the, the shelter, it will be an output will be a product, will never become a process. Mm -hmm. So if you don't think outside your your moment, your construction moment, it will never become a process. And this is one of the proofs that if you are only thinking about the material, that's that's it. You're not you're not really building anything. So thank you very much for your comment. So I have a, a comment from Fiona that um, the plenary is, is starting um, in some minutes. So I think you need to wrap up. If you have any final questions, Marta, can you move to the next slide, please? Just in the meantime, so we have this very short call out. So just to let you know that we have, we are having the call for abstracts for shorter projects. It's open until the 27th of May. 
um, there's something that is in uh, abstract is that in Arabic, English, French, and Portuguese, and Spanish. Um, Elisa, you're cutting. Oh, sorry, I think it doesn't matter. It's fine. Um, but yeah, it was just a uh, full amount. And I will leave you with my. Elisa, you're cutting a bit. Yeah, Elisa, you're not audible. So if you want, I can take over just uh, to let everyone know that the call for abstracts for shelter projects is open until the 27th of May. And this year we are making an extra effort to try and include and be as inclusive as possible. So um, please do send, you, uh, do send us your abstracts. Uh, we are also accepting abstracts in Arabic, uh, English, French, Portuguese, Spanish. And we are trying to expand so not only um, strictly shelter projects, let's say, but beyond shelter. So we are encouraging NFI distributions, cash for sh shelter, HLP, site planning. Uh, so please do feel free to reach out either to me or to Elisa uh, and do consult the website and please submit your abstracts. We will be looking forward to it. And hopefully from this forum, like some of the projects uh, will be regarding climate change, which is something quite important to tackle. So Elisa, I don't know if you want to add anything else. I think my connection is not very good, so I will you and Eva to wrap up. Thank you very much. So yeah, Lisa, now we were hearing you, but just uh, we would like to thank um, the presenters, uh, the organization of the forum, and yeah, the the audience. Thank you for your questions and comments. And Eva, Dave, I don't know if Maya is still in the call. If you would like to add anything else before ending the call. My, I would add one last comment, which is that um, being a shelter practitioner is um, being a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle master. And uh, there's a whole bunch of parts to the jigsaw puzzle. And one option is not to say, I don't like that part and not use it. You can't do that. So the risk to women in collecting the materials, the, the climatic, uh, risks, the affordability, the, all of those other things are all part of that jigsaw puzzle. But the biggest answer to the jigsaw puzzle is that most of the time, most of the pieces can actually figure out where they've got to go. And we just need to give them a bit of a nudge because they're not inanimate objects, they're people and they've got capacity and they've got strengths. And we just need to look at what's stopping them, get to where they need to get to. And, the jigsaw, and that's the answer to solving the jigsaw puzzle. Because if you try to just solve it on your own, you're going to have a very hard time. So I think it's more about empowering local people, using local materials and, and using and focusing on the process um, and, imp and empowering processes. That's the only thing I add. That's the same for climate change. It's the same for any risk that we're facing or any hazard we're facing. That would be my final comment. So, yeah. Thank you very much all for joining. It was an amazing session with really interesting case studies and presentations. Um, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, to um, send them and we will make sure to put you in contact with the presenters. I don't know if C's iPhone wants to add one last comment, but then we should wrap up. Yeah, I think that we should wrap up. Uh, but anyway, uh, thank you very much. And I also, uh, considering the comment and the uh, about supply chain that I didn't have the chance to mention, I don't know if Taylor already left, I think, but still just to let you know that as yesterday, there was uh, a very interesting discussion, as I mentioned, about the, the use of low impact materials. And I think that there will be further discussions and there will be uh, they will be sharing uh, some of the um, discussions uh, and thoughts takeaways from the thoughts and there were like they were really uh, interesting points regarding the materials uh, supply and, and I think that it will be really interesting uh, with all the barriers that we face to promote these low impact materials etc so for everyone who is interested I, I really encourage you not to just check the the, the resources from uh, the 
today's sessions, but also from yesterday's session. Thank you, Eva, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon and next step in the forum. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks, bye. everybody. Bye. Thank you bye. a lot. Bye bye. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Bye.